Hi, I'm Judy Cole, the Executive Vice President and CEO of the MIT Alumni Association, and I'm delighted to welcome you to this web production of the MIT Alumni Association. Thank you, Jessica, that was marvelous. So thanks to the real-time questions, we have a fabulous transition that came in, which is that there was a question about does Professor Transick and what she's shown you here today, does she think about the impact of manufacturing and does she think about the impact of disposal? And I know she does because she's a material scientist by training, um, but that's what my research in my group talks about, uh, it, what we focus on. So Jessica talked about our, the, our energy use, the, the direct impacts of that energy use, the direct opportunities of that energy use, the benefits. And what I want to delve just for a couple minutes here, because we definitely want to get to a good discussion and questions, is what about sort of the indirect? Or what about the, the sort of cascade of manufacturing events? Or, or as, my, as my plots illustrate here, I've got a copper mine in Utah on the upper left. So what are we doing upstream of the energy technologies that Jessica talked about? And then what's happening downstream? So this is on this side here. We've got bales of aluminum cans that are, that are in our municipal recycling facilities. So that's the work that we do, and I'm going to just touch on that briefly today, um, just to, to give you guys a little bit of a sense of what we focus on and where we think the opportunities are, and particularly why I love thinking about these problems at MIT. They're nuanced, they're complicated, they're juicy, and so it's, it's a fabulous place with the, the set of resources and the set of the students that we have here, why it's just a ton of fun. So um, we love this, this polling thing here. Let's see if mine are going to cooperate. Do, do, do. So I'm actually going to skip this first one. So, so I'm going to give you the answer already for this first one um, because we want to get to the, uh, get to the, to the scope of things. But just to, to give a little sense about scale, I like to think about scale in one dimension. So this is my question to you, where I to have given you the answer to, chance to answer it, was how much trash do you throw out per day? Um, just to give you a sense, you know, what do you directly impact, interact with when you're thinking about disposal? So this is a plot from the US EPA over time, past several decades. So 2013, so it's a little bit old, but it takes the EPA, EPA a little while. Um, so we, we, throw about, uh, we throw away, per person, about four pounds of, of trash to, uh, per day. So then, here's the question you guys get to answer. So that's, the, that's, the, that's your direct impact. Your, your direct outflow. So let's expand this question. What if we think about instead, what, what base of materials is, is required for you to live your lives? To drive your cars, for you know, the mining that you do, the devices that you carry. So let's think about how much material is roughly associated with your daily life if you consider all these indirect and direct flows, if you can think about that manufacturing, disposal. So we're talking about inflows now, right? What base of materials is required? In pounds, please. So we've got 100 pounds. At 50, that those numbers are pretty cool. So it's, it's, it's weighting them. The bigger number is the most popular vote. That's what we're seeing there. So I'm gonna, we're going to say that we're getting about 100. Does anybody see 200? I see 200. Anybody see higher? Well, 50,000 pounds. <laughs> nice. Per person per day, right? So let's not forget to divide. OK, so I'm going to cut to the chase here. So it's about 180 pounds per person per day. So about 40 times what we throw out uh, day to day is, is required is an inflow to, to support the way we live. And so that's, that's my snapshot of scale. That's why I think this, the, the way of thinking about this problem from a material science perspective is, is important on a scale level. So the other dimension that I just want to give you a little bit of a snapshot of um, is complexity. So uh, Professor Belcher told us this morning we all love to exist in periodic tables, so I do too. Um, so here, so we've got, we've got this tremendous volume on one axis, and then we've got something about the complexity of these flows on the other axis. So my, my two-second snapshot of that for you of this is over time tracing the number of elements that, we, that are in a circuit board. So elements of the periodic table that are in a circuit board. Let's think about it associated with a cell phone. So in the 1980s, uh, we had 11 elements. And then in the 90s, we added four. And then in the 2000s, we're up to 45. And now we, can, we essentially carry the periodic table in our, in our pockets every day, right? <laughs> and not just because Professor Belcher gave you one as you walked in the door. Um, so, th so those are the two dimensions that I like to think about. It. That's my basis of motivation. It's a tremendous volume, and it's really complicated. Um, and I'm going to just give you just a couple of quick stories. I'm going to skip a bit here about how we, like to, how we like to think about this. So I've got, I've got all sorts of periodic tables, but we're going to skip that one. So I like to think, so in, in terms of thinking about recycling, so if we, if, if we have this tremendous volume that we're producing and we need to get rid of, and it's very complicated, what, what do we do about that? So we, we hear a lot about you know, recycling as, as, as beneficial, um, but, but it's, it's a nuanced, complicated story. So I'm going to tell you a very simple study that we did 
and that was looking at recycling of alkaline batteries. So you think about just the primary batteries that you probably interact with and throw out on a regular basis. California a couple years ago passed a landfill ban, so we weren't going to be throwing them in the trash anymore if you're in California or in New York. We needed to recycle them. So we looked at, was it environmentally beneficial, given the state of technology and the distribution of that technology in the United States to, to recycle an alkaline battery? Here's an alkaline battery. Its dominant materials are manganese, steel, and, and zinc. There are basically four facilities within the United States that were managing these, the, managing these batteries because the, the, the ind battery industry had worked very hard to get mercury out of them. They, they were sort of essentially as close to dirt as you could get. And now we were proposing driving them pretty significant distances around the country to recycle them in these four pretty isolated facilities. And what we learned through this research is, is given the policy as it was put in place and the, and the financial support to, to manage it, given the kind of stuff that Jessica just talked through, it was actually in, environmentally better, given the state of technology, to throw the batteries in the trash than it was to recycle them. And I, it's still today, that is largely true. But based on the fact that we did this research, we discovered that really what we needed for batteries, because what we're getting for them is not super valuable compared to things like cobalt um, or other, you know, nickel, other sort of higher value ma materials that are available in rechargeable batteries. We needed to have a, distri a distributed low cost solution um, or low energy solution, lower temperature solution. And so one of the things that we worked with the battery industry to do is to introduce these alkaline batteries into electric arc furnaces, steel mini mills that are scattered throughout the country. And as long as we could manage the copper concentration so that we weren't poisoning the steel, that was a much better decision from an energy efficiency perspective and environmental perspective. So that's just a tiny snapshot um, on the disposal side. Um, I'm actually going to... Uh, I'll tell you one more quick story on recycling uh, because I'm very passionate about recycling. And then I'm going to show you a, a brick that we've made that I've become very popular for. Um, so before I get to that, another very basic, I even have a piece of paper here. Another very basic thing we're always taught, right, is to recycle, your, put your paper in the recycling bin, right? We all do that. Um, so there, there's a lot of, we, this is a snapshot of the, of the paper and paperboard industry in the U.S. In, in 2013. And it's complicated, right? We call this the spaghetti chart. So something as simple as paper is incredibly complicated. What you're seeing in these middle, these yellow bars in the middle there are all the different kinds of paper that we interact with, right? There's copy paper, there's toilet paper, there's tissue paper, there's cardboard boxes. And all of the flows of, of recycled material, which you see in blue, and virgin fiber from trees you see in brown, they all need to end up in the right places, in the right concentration, so that they can be re recovered into the kinds of products that we want to interact with. So if we have policy that's requiring certain recovered content um, of, of recovered fiber in paper like this, what that's doing in the US, because we're not matching it with increased recovery of these sorts of products, we're not recycling as much as we should, but we're asking for the recycled fiber to appear in these products, is that means that we're putting fiber that, from trees into things like toilet paper. Which, as you can imagine, is a dispersive media, right? We don't recover a lot of that. And so that, that's putting this sort of strange um, you know, tension and strange uh, challenges for the paper industry and for all of us as we try to increase the overall sort of life cycle, manufacturing disposal, in addition to the direct energy that, that Jessica talked about, into the material flows that we interact with. So very simple systems that I've talked about from a high level, right? A piece of paper, a battery. But because of the complex systems in which these things interact, there's a ton of nuance and, and juicy questions to, to answer here. So not only do we like to think about it from a systems perspective um, and from you know, the, the full life cycle perspective, we also like to think about it in technology development. So I'm going to just end on this um, brick that we've developed um, that's based on uh, waste ash. Um, so this is a, a, so taking some of the kinds of, of industrial wastes that would be associated with things like paper production in the U.S., this is actually a project that's, that's based in India. So not only is, is there you know, opportunity to solve these things from an analytical perspective, there's also technology innovation. So we worked with, a, with an industrial cluster in northern India and recovered the, the ash that they were producing from their paper mills and, and, and ba based on taking advantage of the chemistry associated with this brick. So it's, an, it's, it's, alkyl, it's activated with sodium hydroxide plus the ash plus a little bit of clay and a little bit of lime. And we're basically working with this community to replace their red bricks, the typical bricks you think about, that are centered at 1,000 degrees C with this room temperature cured brick that's made of the ash of the region. So there's tons of opportunity here that we're really excited about. 
And so this is, you know, we, we've been working with this, with this town in India to, to make these bricks from their paper production um, and now build them into, into structures of buildings. Um, and so what I want you to think about, as, as John is now going to tell you about sort of the, the, the global flows of, of materials and energy as we think about um, our urban populations, is think about each of these bricks um, that, you know, replacing the red bricks and, and concrete blocks that we work with today uh, to try and build the cities of the future. Thanks again for joining us. For more information on future MIT Alumni Association productions, please visit our website.